I'm one of the chief residents here, and uh, today we're going to talk about debatable therapies in the emergency department, and particularly whether or not I should use this therapy or you should use this therapy. And this is a topic that I wanted to present because there's a, a lot of things that we do in eMERGE that I'm not sure if they work. Um, and then we keep hearing different opinions on various, like, foam networks, MRAP, SmartEM, uh, that tell us maybe this isn't quite as effective. So I thought it'd be really nice to look at the literature myself and, and make my own decision. So we're going to understand, so in terms of our objectives, we're going to try to understand some of the controversies surround some selected ED therapies. I'm going to give you my opinion in terms of what I think we should and should not do, but I'm going to present to you, I think, the most compelling arguments in terms of why or why not. Um, what we're going to talk about is uh, also Tamivir, also known as Tamiflu for influenza. We're going to talk about the prevention of metoclopramide-induced akathisia. Akathisia is that subjective feeling that people have where they feel restlessness when they get Maxaran. Sometimes it's just a subjective feeling where it's very mild. Sometimes they bug out and leave the eMERGE. We're going to talk about sodium polystyrene sulfonate. That's the generic name for Kexalate and its role in treatment of hyperkalemia. And we're going to talk about Tamsulosin, aka Flomax, for symptomatic distal ureteral stones. And finally, we're going to talk about RH immune globulin for first trimester vaginal bleeding. Again, we're going to go through some of the literature. I want you guys to make up your own minds, and hopefully we'll have a bit of a discussion at the end. So I want to thank you guys for completing my survey. Um, around 58 of you uh, finished the survey, and it's a nice 50-50 split between residents and staff. It's really interesting. If you cross-tabulate the results, the staff did better on the first couple of issues, and the residents did better on the last couple. But otherwise, they were fairly similar um, in their results. So our first case. Uh, you have a 26-year-old female, and for 36 hours, she's had cough, fever, chills, myalgias. She was diagnosed with an influenza-like illness yesterday in the ED. Um, and she's back because her symptoms are persistent and she actually wants a note for school. Now, just to make this a very clear-cut diagnosis, let's say a swab was done and the viral culture came back positive for influenza. So there's no doubt in your mind that this is the influenza. And you're considering prescribing Tamiflu. <coughs> now, we're going to take this case and we're going to parse it out into three different cases. So 1A, this is a patient that's otherwise well, doesn't have any risk factors, and has mild disease. Case 1B is a patient that has risk factors, so in that at-risk group that we see in our CDC guidelines and our AMI guidelines. So like asthma, COPD, uh, BMI greater than 40, which is a new one for me, um, age greater than 65, those are all in your at-risk group. And then let's say she actually looks really unwell. She's hypoxic and needs to come into hospital. So should you be initiating this therapy in patients that require inpatient management? So the first survey result, um, if this person is 1A, otherwise well, doesn't have any risk factors, most of you said you would not treat her. 95% of you said that you would not prescribe uh, Tamiflu in otherwise well patients. If this patient had risk factors, anything, 66% of you, so the majority of you, would still not prescribe Tamiflu. So it did drop off quite a bit, though, from 95 to 66, but the majority does not, uh, do not prescribe Tamiflu. I, I will mention, sorry, the previous slide, I think this is the right answer. We shouldn't. For the second slide, I think this is the right answer as well. I don't think we should. Um, finally, when you had your uh, inpatient uh, population, it's a 50-50 split, roughly. So there's a large amount of uncertainty whether or not to treat these patients if they require hospitalization. I think the uncertainty is warranted. I, and I, I have an opinion, and I'll save it to the end. And then when I asked you guys what you thought the treatment benefit was for Tamiflu, most of you got it right. Uh, about 80% of you thought that it reduces the duration of your symptoms by about 20, 24 hours, and that's the myalgias and fevers. Some of you thought it decreased complications in at-risk groups, around 35% of you did. Uh, I don't think it does, and I'll show you the, the evidence why. Um, it does not decrease admissions to hospital, and it doesn't decrease nausea and vomiting. In fact, the opposite is true. It increases the amount of nausea and vomiting you, you encounter. So here are the quote-unquote right answers from our guidelines. So uh, the Canadian AMI guidelines, the Association for Medical Microbiology and Infectious Diseases, they gave a strong recommendation for initiating treatment in patients that present under 48 hours. And then they do wordsmith it a little bit. If they have any risk factors whatsoever, they say you have to give it. If they don't have any risk factors, and they are the mildest um, form of influenza, they say you should strongly consider treatment. So they add that consider part of there. But otherwise, it's a pretty strong recommendation. Now, they do extend that 48-hour window 
If the patient represents any of these at-risk groups, so at-risk, again, COPD, asthma, any coronary artery disease, cardiovascular disease, BMI greater than 40, and age over 65. Also included in this are your pregnant population. And patients with severe disease or hospitalization should have Tamiflu over that 48-hour limit. I will mention there's some variation between our guidelines and guidelines that exist in the world. For example, more restrictive strategies are used in the UK. It's very much an optional therapy for people that don't have risk factors. But I'm going to talk to you about how these guidelines sit with the current level of evidence. So the first study I wanted to talk to you guys about is this Ebel study. Sorry. There we go. So the Ebel study, published in Family Practice of 2013. It included published and unpublished double-blind randomized controlled trials, and they did a meta-analysis. The fact that they included the unpublished studies is actually what makes this meta-analysis so important. For many, many years, all the studies done by Roche, the company that makes Tamiflu, they withheld the results for many, many years. So it became such a problem that even the Cochrane Review, they initially were heavily in favor of the use of Tamiflu, and they since hedged their bets, believing that the fact that this data has not been released for such a long time may provide some severe risk of bias. So they actually went from a very strong recommendation to kind of watering it down. And I think this study shows us why. One other really important thing with this study is the unpublished data exclusively included patients that were in those at-risk groups. So one study only included patients that had chronic cardiac or pulmonary disease, and another one included patients over the age of 65. Of course, they didn't study pregnant patients. So they measured things that we care about, some things we care about more than others. They measured the mean duration of your symptoms, so myalgias and fevers. They measured complications, such as pneumonia, morbidity, mortality, and hospitalization rates. In their study, they also stratified their results to include patients based on a clinical diagnosis of the flu, so that's the ITT clinical. And they also stratified patients according to lab-confirmed influenza, so that's the ITTI group. I'm going to present you both sets of data. Obviously, for us, the clinical diagnosis one is the most important. So what they found was that there's a mean reduction of symptoms by about 20 hours if you treated with Tamiflu. It did not make a difference with hospitalization, and it did not decrease complications, such as pneumonia. If you looked at the patients that had a clinical, sorry, a laboratory-confirmed diagnosis of influenza, they had a mean duration of symptoms of about 25 hours, so a bit better. No difference in their hospitalization rate. And interestingly, they found that pneumonias were slightly reduced if you treated the patient with Tamiflu. It's an absolute risk reduction of 0.9%. And if you look at the confidence intervals, it's 0.1 to 1.7, with a number needed to treat of 111 patients. So it's debatable whether this is useful for us. One of the really compelling things that came out of this paper is when they looked at just the patients that represented that at-risk group, patients over the age of 65, patients with... Uh-oh. Good. So if they looked at patients that just were in those at-risk groups, over the age of 65 or with chronic disease, they did not show a decrease in complications. And they actually didn't get any benefit from Tamiflu. So statistically, it was like the placebo. Now, the limitations of this study is that the endpoints were somewhat questionable. I kind of care about symptom duration, but not as much as I care about hospitalizations, morbidity, mortality. And those last two were less well studied. And there's this issue of a moderate system cost versus minimal benefit. And we're going to talk about this in a couple minutes. This I thought was really interesting. The Michael study in 2013 was a systematic review of existing systematic reviews, because there's been so many in the literature. So they only looked at systematic reviews of randomized control trials, and they assigned a grade rating to each one of the findings. And the way the grade rating works is they give it a high, moderate, or low. High means there's no problems or maybe one problem, but otherwise this is relatively good evidence. Moderate means there's two problems in their studies, and low means three or more. One way to think about this is if something has a low grade of evidence, if a well-designed trial came out with minimal flaws, it would trump the low evidence of data. Okay? So this is what they found. High level of evidence, 
So the studies agreed that there's an increase in adverse events with Tamiflu. It causes nausea and vomiting, and they agreed on that. There's moderate level of evidence that it decreases the duration of symptoms in your healthy patients and your patients that represent a risk factor. And there's low level of evidence, so shady evidence, that it decreases uh, the alleviation of, sorry, improves alleviation of symptoms in the elderly and it reduces complications. So we do have better data. The study that I showed you before, the Ebel data, um, is higher level quality of evidence, and it contradicts some of this. It says there's no benefit in the elderly, and it does not reduce complications. I think this summarizes what the Michael studies was getting at. Is that there seems to be some data that suggests that it decreases the duration of symptoms, but it's a balance. On one hand, you have decreased duration of symptoms. On the other, there's cost, side effects, and resistance. Cost I made extra big because it's not just the financial cost of the medication, there's the system cost involved. It's my time, it's your time, it's the nurse's time, it's them registering a triage, taking up a bed, um, increasing the volume in the department. There's the side effects. And like I said, the previous uh, systematic review said nausea and vomiting is a clear-cut side effect. And there's the resistance pattern. We, we saw a huge bump in the resistance uh, after H1N1 when we had a more liberal strategy with, with uh, Oseltamivir. There's a very compelling quote that I'm just going to read directly from the study. The combination of diagnostic uncertainty, the risk for virus strain resistance, the possible side effects and financial costs outweigh the small benefits of oseltamivir for the prophylaxis and treatment of healthy individuals. No relevant uh, benefits of oseltamivir on complications in at-risk individuals has been established. Obviously, this study also has a few problems. The systematic review didn't include the unpublished studies, and it didn't include, and most of the studies were industry-sponsored. We know this is a really big problem because um, Roche re withheld a lot of the data, um, and there's very little evidence in your at-risk groups. So back to our, our three cases. So I think for 1A, there's really minimal symptom benefit if initiated within that 48-hour window, and it doesn't reduce hospitalizations or complications. And in fact, it will increase, increase nausea and vomiting. If you're a patient that represents that at-risk group, uh, greater than the age of uh, 65, chronic disease processes, there's no observed treatment benefit. And in fact, it doesn't reduce hospitalizations and complications if you have a clinical diagnosis of influenza. This doesn't really apply to pregnant patients because it really hasn't been studied. What about the inpatient data? Unfortunately, there aren't any RCTs with the inpatient data. So I'm going to talk about a systematic review of the observational studies um, that excluded RCTs. And 51 of these were for Tamiflu. And they also assigned a grade level of evidence and they found that also Tamivir may decrease mortality in hospitalized patients, and they gave this a low grading. They also said also Tamivir may decrease the rate of hospitalization, um, and this was a very low level of evidence. I bring this up because that second point uh, we said we don't agree with, based on the better uh, randomized control uh, study data that we have. Um, so it kind of throws the entire issue into question. In addition, there's a lot of problems with these studies. Um, the data itself is relatively poor quality studies. Most of the observational studies did not adjust for confounders. Many of the data pieces were gathered from insurance databases. There's a high risk of reporting and publication bias. There's a lot of clinical heterogeneity. And what I mean by that is when you looked at the inpatient population, the observational studies were either ward patients or ICU patients, and they didn't necessarily adjust for those confounders. Um, it's not really supported by the higher quality of evidence, and it may represent more of a correlation rather than causation. So when I was looking at some of these individual observational studies, what tended to come up is the patients that were more sick, that presented days after their influenza infection, uh, did not have a good prognostic outcome. They did not get Tamiflu. And patients that presented early looked more like a clear-cut viral infection, didn't have a concurrent pneumonia, otherwise more well. Those patients did get Tamiflu. So when you're looking at these observational studies, my impression was the sickest patients did not get Tamiflu and had a worse outcome. Not because of the Tamiflu, but just because they were sicker. Unfortunately, it's all the data that we have. So the observational data shows a mortality benefit. It's very questionable, but I think our guidelines say we should use it, and there's no compelling data for us to say we shouldn't start it. So just back to our case. If this patient had 36 hours of fevers, chills, myalgias, had an influenza-like illness, and I'm thinking about treating them as an outpatient, unless she's pregnant, I'm not going to start Tamiflu. 
Um, if she needs to be admitted, I'll start it. So just my bottom line. Um, Tamiflu does not decrease hospitalization rates. It may decrease the duration of symptoms, but you're giving patients a trade-off. They may get 24 hours less of fevers and aches, but they might be throwing up. Tamiflu has an unclear role in reducing mortality in hospitalized patients, and there's that issue with complications. Like, if you have a clinical diagnosis, it doesn't decrease your chance of pneumonia or other complications, but if the lab comes back positive, does that number need to treat of 100, which just barely um, uh, reached that confidence interval of 0.1. I'm just going to move on to case two. Um, this is a 30-year-old female with typical migraine headache, normal neurological exam, and just wants symptomatic relief, and they've been treated with Maxaran in the past. Just as you order your 10 milligrams of Maxaran, the nurse asks you if you want to give Benadryl. And she asks that because of this phenomenon of med uh, medical mind induced akesthesia. That's when you give Maxaran, and people get this subjective feeling of restlessness. Sometimes it's mild. Sometimes they actually bug out and leave the eMERGE. So when I asked you guys, what do you do? 71% 71 of, 71 of you do not co-administer Benadryl with Maxaran. So most of you don't do this. I think that's the right answer, actually, and I'll tell you why. When I asked you what the most effective way was to prevent medical bromide induced akathisia, so that subjective feeling of restlessness, most of you said it's with a slow administration over 15 minutes. I also think that's the right answer. Um, but there looks like there's a bit of confusion in terms of what the literature says, and we'll address that. The Friedman study back in 2009 did a really nice, well-done trial to look at uh, medical bromide induced akathisia. They looked at high versus low dose Maxaran, and they looked at co-administration with diphenhydramine or placebo. And uh, they measured akathisia in a few different ways. One was uh, a blinded assessor looking at the patient, seeing how restless they were, pacing the room, tapping their hands, asking them if they actually felt that subject of restlessness. And they also uh, measured if the patients required rescue medication. It is a bit of a small study, so 286, but it was powered to detect a 10% difference. So otherwise, it was really well done. And they basically found diphenhydramine has no effect. So the odds ratio was 1.0. Uh, if, if I can draw your attention to the table with the red box around it, it shows you the low-dose Maxaran, which is what we typically use, with and without diphenhydramine. And the numbers are essentially the same, about 11% versus 7%, and 8% versus 9%. So no real big difference. There was a slight trend towards increased akesthesia if you gave them the high-dose medical bromide, but they didn't find it to be significant. So that's an odds ratio of 1.7. There are some limitations with the study. Um, it included all patients with nausea and vomiting. Um, some of them had an intradominal process. Some of them were secondary to migraines. It was a small trial, but it was power to detect a difference. And uh, they did use a lower dose of diphenhydramine, 25 milligrams. Some studies use 50, some use 25. It's not really a well-established practice which dose you should use. Uh, the Erder study in 2012 um, repeated this, and they looked at a three-arm study looking at diphenhydramine versus placebo versus midazolam. And they thought, if we can get people to relax that subject of feeling restlessness, midazolam or benzo might be a better agent. They found no difference between placebo and diphenhydramine. They did find placebo versus midazolam. Midazolam tended to have lower akathisia scores. They tended to be more relaxed. That's not a really big surprise. The assessors, if you look at their questionnaires, looking if the patient is restless, moving around, tapping their hand, whether they have that subjective feeling of restlessness. With the midazolam, these patients were asleep. So they were more sedate rather than representing akathisia. They did use a lower dose as well, so 20 milligrams. And that's because that's all their, their vials only came in 20 milligram ampules. So they could either give 20 or 40. So this is on the lower end. We're now going to talk about infusion rates. Um, so the Parlax study in 2005 looked at um, comparing 10 milligrams of metoclopramide infused over two minutes versus infused over 15. They did a really good job lining this. Like whether or not you were in the infusion or bolus group, a nurse would be pushing something and there'd be a, a pole dripping something else in. Uh, so they did a really good job maintaining uh, blinding in this. And they used a similar akathisia instrument score, so that subjective feeling, um, as well as a, a rater score. And they also checked to see if um, whether the bolus effect had any chance of reducing symptoms faster. So on this table, SIG repre represents your slow infusion group. Your big is bolus infusion. And they found a really big difference. So an odds ratio of five. And if you just look at those numbers, like those are huge. 
if you gave somebody a slow infusion, their acacia rate was around 5.8. And if you bolused it, it was 24.7. So a fairly big difference. Um, interestingly, they actually found that there was a higher rate of severe acacia. So we don't really care about, well, we do care about the mild acacia. We don't want to make patients uncomfortable. But we really worry about the patient's going to bug out and leave the eMERGE. And they found a really big difference in the bolus versus infusion group. So about 11 patients in the bolus group versus two had severe acacia. There was no difference in the presenting complaints. So the bolus didn't actually resolve their symptoms any faster. There are some problems with the study. There was no inter-rater reliability scores, and the, the scoring sheet was actually done by residents. Um, they didn't adequately describe the randomization, and it's a single center study in Turkey. However, there are two additional studies that reinforce this principle of a slow infusion. Tura in 2012 uh, did a very similar study, uh, randomized control trial with bolus versus infusion. They found very similar results. So bolus group had a accuracy rate of 26%, which is similar to the one before, and uh, slow infusion about 7%. Reagan et al., this is a smaller study, uh, but they found a similar positive result. So what about, so why do we, why, what, if metoclopramide never really had a significant effect with diphenhydramine, if, if that was never a, an issue and there's no positive studies, why do we do it? Why do we adopt this practice? And it's about, it's because of prochlorperazine, aka stematil. And so the earlier studies in stematil showed the exact opposite results. They showed that stematil is amenable to prophylaxis with diphenhydramine, and there's no difference with infusion rates with stematil, bolus versus uh, infusion. So the first study, the Vincent study in 2001, um, showed an absolute risk reduction of 22%, with a number needed to treat of five to prevent one acacia event if you co-administer Benadryl. They used a higher dose, about 50 milligrams. This is actually an article we did at Journal Club many, many years ago. Um, they also demonstrated that slow infusion has no bearing with the effect with uh, um, Semitil. So 50 minutes versus two minutes. A negative study by Vincent et al. This is a different Vincent study. Showed no decrease. And the Collins study also did not show a decrease. So that's really interesting and kind of puzzling. Why does Benadryl work with Semitil but not with Maxaran? And why does slow infusion work with Maxaran but not with Stematil? So I contacted the authors, Freeman and Vincent, and they both actually sent me a very similar reply in both instances. And they boil it down to a difference in the drugs and a difference in the study, in the study design. So if you look at the acesthesia rates between both um, Stematil and Maxaran, the placebo rate of acesthesia is different in each group. And so that might be more of a drug effect. Also, the fact that one agent is amenable to bolus and one is not also points to another drug effect. There are differences in their study design. So Vinson used 50 milligrams of Benadryl, whereas Friedman used 20. Uh, and in addition, Friedman only infused the uh, uh, medical bromide, whereas Vinson bolused his uh, nonstop. So it is interesting. There are differences in the study, but there are probably some inherent differences in the drug. So if you think about droperidol, haloperidol, very, very similar drugs, both have very different contraindications for some odd reason and different uses, but mechanistically they're probably quite similar. So if this patient comes to uh, eMERGE and I'm seeing her, and if I treat her with metoclopramide 10 milligrams, I'm not going to give her Benadryl, but I'm going to ask the nurse to infuse it over 15 minutes. So my bottom line here is uh, metoclopramide induced acacia can be reduced with the slow infusion, uh, but it's not decreased with diphenhydramine free treatment. So case three, 45-year-old gentleman comes into your eMERGE with plank pain. Um, a CT scan shows a 5.2 millimeter stone in the distal ureter with mild hydronephrosis. Their pain's controlled and they're actually looking for symptomatic treatment and they want to go home. So in addition to analgesia, you consider prescribing tamsulosin. So I asked you guys, what do you normally do? Um, most of you say you routinely prescribe tamsulosin, around 70%. I agree with that. Um, and I'll tell you why in a bit. When I asked you guys what the evidence was, this is actually very interesting. Although 70% of you say you routinely prescribe it, only 21 of you thought the evidence suggests that it's useful in most cases. Um, so you, you prescribe it, but you don't think that it's evidence-based. Um, most of you feel that it, there's no evidence to support its use. So 40% thought no use. And there seems to be some confusion whether regard uh, stone size has any bearing in terms of whether it's useful or not. 
So why do we use tamsulosin? Well, it's this whole idea of medical expulsive therapy. We use agents to relax the distal smooth muscle in the distal ureter, um, and we use alpha-1 antagonists. Tamsulosin is the most well-studied, but there are others, terosacin, alfuzacin, doxazacin. And in addition, uh, calcium channel blockers have been uh, used for the same effect. There are a lot of studies, a lot of studies, showing mixed results. Most of them are positive. Um, so why is there such controversy? Well, before 2008, a lot of the studies had methodological flaws. There were small trials, open label, unclear randomization process. The recruitment was done mostly in the urology office rather than the ED. Um, so they may present a different spectrum of disease. And the systematic reviews prior to 2008 favored medical expulsive therapy over standard therapy, mostly because of a garbage-in, garbage-out effect. So we're going to talk about the post-2008 period. We're going to talk about four RCTs and one meta-analysis. And the reason why is I think this is a very controversial topic. I think this will kind of get around why it's controversial and what you should be doing. So Hermans in 2009, uh, he did a randomized double-blind control trial, the first one, uh, looking at tamsulosin, and looked at stone expulsion rate at 21 days for distal ureteral stones. And it was a negative study. It did not show a benefit with tamsulosin. Um, the secondary outcomes, they found that there was less total analgesia use if you were given uh, tamsulosin. And they found a non-significant trend towards uh, a decrease in time to stone passage. In other words, they found a non-significant trend that patients were passing stones faster with tamsulosin. A difference of about three days. Uh, three days keeps coming up, so just remember that for a second. One of the big strengths of this study is that it was the first randomized double-blind control trial looking at tamsulosin, and it was one of the first ED-based studies. So it really reflects more of the patient population we see. Some of the limitations were that they had a high number of small stones with a mean diameter of less than four millimeters, and this led to a very high rate of stone passage. I'm just going to go back to the previous slide. So 86 and 88 percent. These are high numbers, very high numbers. The normal expectation for three weeks would have been around 66% in the urology literature. Um, also, they found a, uh, they didn't know the stone passage time in a third of their patients. So they didn't know when the st uh, stone passed in a third of their patients. The Vincent Doe study, this is a, a French study, a multi-center French study in 2010, um, that was also a negative result. Uh, so they did not show a difference between tamsulosin and placebo. <clears throat> they also did not find any differences in their secondary uh, analyses and secondary outcomes. No difference in mean expulsion time, analgesic use, adverse events. One of the other limitations of this study is, again, relatively high rate of stone passage compared to earlier studies, so both of which were over 70%. And it also had a number of small stones. So now we're going to talk about a positive study. So the Alan Sari study, another randomized double-blind control trial, looking at 28 days, and this one was a positive study for tamsulosin. So 82% um, uh, for the tamsulosin group versus 61, a P value of 0.02. This is a number needed to treat of five uh, to increase stone passage rate. Um, their secondary outcomes, they found a decreased time in stone passage. Um, <coughs> if you're given tamsulosin, a difference of, again, about three days. Um, and no significant increase in adverse events. So interestingly, Compared to the previous study, this one actually included larger stones. So the mean stone diameter was around 5.9 millimeters. It was a bit smaller and it wasn't multicenter compared to the Vincent Doe study, but it does represent a different patient population with larger stones. So Abdul Miguel, this is the fourth RCT, really wanted to suss things out with these larger stones. So they did the same kind of trial, but they looked at 4 to 10 millimeter stones. And this was also another positive study favoring tamsulosin. Uh, so this one had a number needed to treat of about 4. They found that the greatest benefit was with regard to stone size. So stones greater than 7 millimeters tended to have greater benefit. They also found a significant decrease in total analgesia use. This is a really busy slide, but I think it summarizes some of the main points of the article. Group A is placebo. Group B is with tamsulosin. And they wanted to track when these patients were passing their stones, week one, week two, week three, week four. Here I'm showing you all stones, so you can see there's a big gain in the first two weeks, 10% in the placebo, 17% with tamsulosin. It's week two, 12% with placebo, 45% with tamsulosin. Big gains. 
This is just looking at large stones now, so stones greater than 7 millimeters. Again, they notice very big improvements with tamsulosin use. So 4%, 4%, about the same. In the second week, the passage rate almost doubled, so 8% versus 19%. In the third week, more than doubles, 8% versus 23%. And in the fourth week, again, just doubles, 4 and 9%. So there's some limitations to this study. There's some methodological flaws, actually. They didn't include an a priori um, outcome and sample size calculation, unlike the other two studies. And they didn't include confidence intervals. So this is definitely the weakest of the RCTs. But it may demonstrate a reason why we're seeing such mixed results. Part of it is our patient population. Patients with more severe disease, larger stones, may benefit more from treatment. So similar to when we think about steroids and sepsis, why is there one study that says it works and another that says it doesn't? Patient factors really matter. So now we're going to talk about the Mayo study. Uh, this is a new uh, systematic review and meta-analysis in CGEM, uh, published in 2013. And they did something very interesting. In addition to looking at all the previous RCTs, they want to look at just the studies that had very low risk of bias, as measured by the Cochrane tool, and they just wanted to look at the double-blind randomized control trials. This table just shows you all the different trials that have been done and they included. In the red box, these are the studies that we talked about. These are the four randomized double-blind control trials. At the very top there in the middle, there's a DeCeo article. This was just a, an RCT that wasn't blinded. The Abdul-Miguel, the one that didn't have the adequate power calculation and adequate uh, co uh, sorry, confidence intervals, that's the reason why it's in the middle. Again, another very busy slide, but it kind of distills like, the eight-page article down to a single slide. The expulsion rate, so obviously the study found a positive result. They found that expulsion rate favor, was favored in the tamsulosin group, a relative risk of 1.5. Now there is a lot of heterogeneity there. So you have to question whether or not you can group all these studies together and whether you can trust the result. But if you just look at the subgroups, so the double blind trials and the high quality trials, the double blind randomized control trials showed a benefit, relative risk of 1.2, with moderate heterogeneity. The four studies that represented the low risk bias, they showed a trend towards benefit, not significant, but also with a lot of heterogeneity. And if you looked at just stone size, just the big stones, this is where you saw the biggest gains. So relative risk of 1.65 with moderate heterogeneity. Those are a lot of nice numbers, but does it really translate into patient uh, care? How can I actually use these numbers? So I just want to show you the forest plot, everything's down the line on one side favoring tamsulosin. So this is where I think actually the article really shines, is that it shows something that I can actually apply to my patients and something I can, I can actually talk to my patients about. So the mean decreased time to stone expulsion was around three days. That's what we found in the double-blind control trials over and over again. Again, this one represents moderate heterogeneity. But if we just look at the high-quality studies, the double-blind randomized control trials and the low-risk of bias trials, just those articles, we find that there's a decent decrease in duration of, uh, oh, sorry, an increased transit time for the stones. So a decrease in stone symptoms for about two days in the double-blind randomized control trial, and a difference of about three days in the high-quality studies with low risk of bias, both of which represent low heterogeneity. This is something I can talk to my patients about. I can give you this medication. It may decrease your duration of symptoms by about three days. And if I had a stone, I think I would take that if I could pay for it or if it was covered. They also looked at adverse event rates. And they did find a significant increase in retrograde ejaculation with tamsulosin. It was temporary. And when I talked to the author, it was very, very small numbers. Eight in the tamsulosin group, zero in the non-tamsulosin group. So a very, very small number. And there's no difference in gastrointestinal symptoms, orthostatic hypotension, dizziness, or weakness. So just to get back to the case, so this patient had a 5.2 millimeter stone. It's a big stone. Um, I would prescribe tamsulosin. In terms of my bottom line, so I think tamsulosin can be safely used for treatment in distal ureteral stones. I think it's reasonable to offer treatment in all patients. Um, the meta-analyses of the RCTs and the double-blind control trials show benefit. Um, and most of the studies point to a benefit in terms of decreased time for stone passage. And it seems to work best in, in large stones. When I first designed this talk, I thought I was going to poo-poo on Tamsulos, and I thought this was going to be useless, we shouldn't be using it anymore. But uh, my opinion definitely has changed. 
Um, so we're going to jump into our, fourth, uh, our next case. So this one's a quickie. This is a 65-year-old gentleman with end-stage renal disease, and he comes in with pneumonia sepsis. And let's say his potassium is 7, um, and his VBG shows a metabolic acidosis. So you discuss the case with the nephrology. They're happy to accept this case. They're going to come and admit the patient. But they want you to start a few things before they get there and start dialysis. So I asked you guys what you thought the most effective treatments were, or ineffective treatments were, sorry. And most of you said K-exalate was the least effective. About 69% of you thought that. I think that's the right answer. And we're going to talk about why. So a bit of background. Sodium polystyrene sulfonates, this is a generic name for K-exalate. Um, it was released back in like the 1950s, 1960s. This was before there was widespread hemodialysis. And this was seen as a novel therapy for what was then called potassium intoxication. Now, the FDA accepted this into practice, that we can use this medication based on the theoretical reasoning as in terms of why it worked and animal studies. But there weren't any human trials to prove effectiveness. So the Flynn study, this is one of the first human trials, and they had 10 hyperkalemic oliguric patients. And for five days, five long days, they were fed a diet of ginger ale, caro syrup, and dextrose IV. And that's it. Some of them got sorbitol, and some of them got sorbitol plus um, k -exalate. And it basically didn't find a difference. These are the values for, for whatever it interests you, day zero versus day five. You see very modest decreases in potassium. Um, and this wasn't clinically sig or sorry, statistically significant. So the study made it unclear if the benefit was from sorbitol, sorbitol plus resin, or was it just five days of having sugar water? So arguably, it's useless in the acute period, right? Going from a potassium of 6.2 to 4.8 over five days, that's not really going to help us out. So 35 years later is the next uh, big human study. Uh, so this is the Gray Capral study. And what they did is they took six patients, all of which had end-stage renal disease, and they gave them a treatment. And they gave them a new treatment every week for five weeks. And the way they timed these treatment is that two days after your dialysis, you got some treatment, and it was one day pre your next dialysis. What they studied was placebo. They studied uh, resin on its own, resin with sorbitol. And they did two studies with phenylphthalein. Um, it was something new that they were trying out to see if it worked. And basically, this was a negative study. They found that there was no benefit. Um, a Cochrane review was recently done in 2009, and I just included the table there. So you can see at four hours, eight hours, 12 hours, very minimal changes. In fact, it wasn't statistically significant. I'm just going to read you a quote directly from the study that I thought was quite compelling. We believe that the effect of resin cathartic therapy in patients with hazardous hyperkalemia would be the same effect we observed in the present study, which was little or no change in serum potassium concentration. Yikes. So now we're going to talk about complications of SPS. So this is one of the reasons why we shouldn't use it. Uh, since 1992, there's been an increasing phenomenon of bowel necrosis and uh, bowel perforation, thought to be secondary to the sodium polystyrene sulfonate. The estimated risk was around 0.2 to 1.8%. Harold did a systematic review looking at all the positive cases that came up in the literature and tried to figure out if there's risk factors. First of all, he found that there was no difference between sorbitol versus with or without sorbitol. They found the mortality rate was around 33%, and they found patients with acute kidney injury were at highest risk, as well as patients in the post-operative period. Stearns did a really nice review back in 2010, and I think this summarizes the debate. Uh, clinicians must weigh the uncontrolled studies showing benefit against the uncontrolled studies showing harm, and it would be wise to exhaust other alternatives for managing hyperkalemia before turning to these largely unproven and potentially harmful therapies. So back to our case, um, if this patient had severe hyperkalemia, I'll use things that I, I think work. So we can give them calcium, we can give them insulin and D50, we can give them bicarb, we can give them Ventolin. If somebody's asking me to start Kexalate, I'm going to say no. I don't think the evidence supports it. I think there's risk factors. And if they really insist on us using this therapy, they should spread it themselves. So my bottom line for Kexalate is I don't think that this rapidly reduces K levels. It's unclear if it works in the long term. And it does, it does have a potential risk of an adverse event. And the highest risk is in patients with acute kidney injury, presumably the patients that we would treat.
So our last case. This is a 22-year-old female. Not this blood spot, but that's the case. Uh, a 22-year-old female, G1P0, eight weeks by dates, with mild vaginal bleeding and mild spotting. She has no risk factors for ectopic pregnancy. In fact, when you do an ultrasound, um, you identify an IUP on ultrasound, and the os is closed. She tells you that her blood type is O negative. So before discharging your home, you think about uh, getting a blood type on her and treating her with rhesus immunoglobulin. So I asked you guys, what do you think? Do you normally do this? And the vast majority think that you should. So give Rogam. I agree, and we'll talk about why. So rhesus immunoglobulin, aka Rogam, aka Winro, uh, is something we give to Rh negative women to prevent a sensitizing event. And if you think back to first year medical school, this is when an Rh negative woman has an Rh positive baby, there's a bit of blood that leaks into the bloodstream, and she develops antibodies. And we care about those antibodies because in subsequent pregnancies, it represents a significant risk of morbidity and mortality for subsequent babies. Basically, mom cells attack the baby. So we have this agent called Winro uh, that we can give to prevent this, this immunizing event. And the, the immunizing event is called isoimmunization, immunization, sensitization, all throughout the literature. There's a clear benefit in this medication uh, in the peripartum period, postpartum period, peri-instrumentation, and late pregnancy period. But it really hasn't been well studied in the first trimester bleeds. So a really nice review in 2006 by Hannafin um, uh, did a systematic review looking at all the sources of literature uh, on first trimester bleeding. And they didn't find a whole lot. Um, we're going to go through each one of the, these uh, sections. So first, the RCT is a Fisher study from 1990, or 1972. I couldn't get this study. Um, it's like not available electronically. It's not available in the library. We can't get it through interlibrary loan. Uh, it's locked up somewhere. Um, so I couldn't get it. But luckily, there was um, a Cochrane review uh, that included just this Vischer study. So this is the only RCT. And basically, it's a really crappy RCT. Small number, about 48. There was no sensitizing events. Uh, but the big problem was that it was likely underpowered. So the true sensitization rate is likely very, very small. Um, they didn't have clear methods of randomization. So although it's a negative study, it didn't show any increase in sensitizing events or decreases, it's tough to rely on it. There's a case control study uh, back in 2003 by Hernandez Adrade. Um, and what they did is they took 24 cases where women became sensitized in the first trimester, or sorry, throughout their pregnancy, 24 controls where they did not, and they tried to figure out what are some risk factors. And they found that bleeding over 20 weeks was a risk factor. Bleeding under 20 weeks was not a risk factor. So they couldn't find an association between early bleeds and developing a sensitizing event. This is a very interesting case report. Uh, a 35-year-old uh, RH negative woman with first trimester bleeding came to the eMERGE with spotting, <laughs> discharged home, did not receive uh, Rogam. She then followed up with her OBGYN, and they did a test that did not find any anti-D antibodies. She had not sensitized at that point. She then had an amniocentesis done just because of advanced age, where she received Rogam. And then many, many months later, they found that she had become sensitized. So what was the sensitizing event? Was it the first bleed in eMERGE where she didn't get Rogam? That's weird because she didn't have any antibodies form afterwards. Or was it the amniocentesis? This is a known risk factor for developing uh, a sensitizing event. So the literature that we have is very unreliable. So now we are focusing on the theoretical reasoning why we should. So the, fe the fetal maternal hemorrhage uh, transfusion medicine literature. So basically, if you have an eight-week fetus, it has about 0.33 mils of blood. And if you have a 12-week fetus, it's about three mils of blood. And you need about 0.1 mils of blood, of fetal red cells, necessary to have a sensitizing event. So this is really controversial. We're going to talk about that 0.1 and where that number comes from. So this is a Zapersky article back in uh, 1967. And they did an observational study of over 1,000 women, 573 of which uh, RH-negative mothers had RH-negative children. And what they did is they did a blood test to see how much fetal maternal hemorrhage had occurred. So I want to draw your attention to the table here in red. That first row, zero to four cells. So this is like a modified clay harrow betke It's a bit different from the standard one. And they looked to see if there's any signs of uh, maternal hemorrhage or none. So basically, if they said no red blood cells, no signs of uh, fetal maternal hemorrhage, everything looks okay. 
they got put into that first column or first row. That represented the volume of around zero mils to 0 0.1 mils. And they found a 3% sensitization rate. These are women that did not receive Winrow or Rogam. This was before it was widely available. And these were, these were their results. So there's a theoretical reasoning there. I mean, arguably, um, the sensitizing event could have been many, many weeks, many, many months prior. But they estimated that most of the bleeds probably happened in that last, uh, during labor and delivery. So there's that theoretical reasoning, and that's the reason where that 0.1% came from. Um, so then I looked at the guidelines and our expert opinions. So the American guidelines say that you should consider rhesus immunoglobulin or Rogram under 12 weeks. The British guidelines, the ARCOG, said you don't need to give it under 12 weeks. They have a much more restrictive strategy. So here are the SOGC guidelines from 2003, and the main author is Dr. Funky Fung. And it says after miscarriage or threatened abortion or induced abortion during the first 12 weeks of gestation, non-sensitized D-negative women should be given a minimum of 120 milligrams of uh, Rogam. If it's after 12 weeks, give them the big dose. So a, a very liberal strategy. So I, I chatted with Dr. Funky Fung asking her, you know, why this? Why is you know, it's not really supported by the literature? And, and why did you come up with this rationale? And why is there a difference between guidelines? So she outlined that much of the variation in the guidelines between us in the US and us in the UK has to do with the availability of Rogam or Winro. We have a huge supply uh, in Canada, and we're very lucky to have this, whereas the supply is quite limited um, in the UK, which has led to the guidelines being much more restrictive. New guidelines are going to be coming out in the next year or two. She can't give me a hint in terms of which way things are going to go, but it's unlikely that things will change because it will unlikely be studied in North America. This has become so much the standard of practice that it'd be tough to change. So then I had a chat with Dr. Jalevi. Now, Dr. Jalevi works with transfusion medicine, also works as an immunologist, and works for the WHO. And he gave me a very interesting perspective on this topic. The cost of Winrow is cheap, about 60 to 100 bucks, 60 for the low dose, 100 for the big dose. And if a patient, let's say, had a sensitizing event, let's say they developed a low titer of anti-D antibodies, they will still give Winro in that patient, believing that the Winro will mop up those antibodies and prevent future sensitizing events. So that blew my mind. Like I thought once you formed antibodies, that's it, game over, you're done. But they've shown that Winro will actually act on the antibodies, cause macrophages to ingest them, and may allow normal pregnancies in the future. Looking at the surveillance data from the WHO, um, they found that uh, countries that have a more restrictive strategy with regard to Winro have higher rates of isoimmunization. So from his perspective, we should be using this. There's a lot of theoretical reasonings why, and there's some population-based studies why we should. So for a 22-year-old female um, that comes in with first trimester bleeding, I'm going to test her blood and I'm going to give her Rogam. So my bottom line with this is that I think rhesus immunoglobulin should be given in first trimester bleeding. There's minimal risks, sorry, there's major risks with sensitization, especially with first pregnancies. There's minimal risks with rhesus immunoglobulin. Occasionally you get like an immune reaction because uh, it is a blood product. And there's a lot of theoretical benefit. Because there's such limited evidence, and I don't think there's any convincing data to show a negative study, like that this doesn't work, I think it's important to follow our consensus guidelines and our expert opinions. And if it changes in the next year or two, um, I'll, I'll probably follow those practices, but I'll probably lean more on the giving Rogam uh, side of, of the argument. So just to summarize our objectives, we talked about Tamiflu for influenza, and if you're going to be treating these patients as outpatients, I don't think we should give it. If they're pregnant, talk to them, maybe, because I don't think there's any evidence, but for your, your otherwise your at-risk patients, your otherwise healthy patients, I don't think there's a role. Uh, we can prevent medical induced acesthesia by giving it slowly, and I don't think diphenhydramine helps. I don't think we should be using Kxlate for hyperkalemia. I think it's not proven, and I think the risks are there. I think tamsulosin can work for symptomatic distal ureteral stones. It seems to work most with large stones, and it may offer a, a treatment benefit in terms of decreasing the symptom duration. If I had a stone, give me the tamsulosin. And with regard to uh, rhesus mean globulin for first trimester vaginal bleeding, 
I think we should be giving it. I think there's theoretical evidence, population-based studies, to show that it might work. And, the, and having a woman develop the uh, anti-D antibodies could be devastating. So these are my acknowledgments. Dr. Gatchian, thank you so much. He's sitting at the back. You're a really big help. Um, Dr. Rosenberg gave me some really nice advice. We corresponded through email. Dr. Fungi Fung was very kind and chatted with me several times uh, regarding the fetal maternal hemorrhage um, ROGAM issue. And same thing with Dr. Jalevi. And then Dr. Friedman, Dr. Benson, Dr. Mela, these are some of the authors that I contacted to help clarify some of the issues in their papers. These are my references. I'm happy to take any questions. No questions. One thing I will.